Okay, uh, for the second half of this presentation then, um, I'll be talking about uh, slow sand filters for as an, equal, uh, an alternate uh, approach to water treatment. So in this presentation, I'll talk about uh, what is slow sand filtration, uh, how uh, a system might be designed and operated, and then some research that we've done to investigate how slow sand filters actually work. So slow sand filters are um, commonly confused with rapid sand filtration systems. Rapid sand filtration systems are commonly used in um, agricultural operations. And what I'll do is I'll describe both of these uh, systems so that we can see where they differ. Rapid sand filters use a coarse sand uh, matrix. Um, typically, the sand grains are greater than a millimeter in diameter. Um, because of that coarseness, uh, they're only able to remove large particulates that are suspended in the water. They don't remove pathogens. They don't remove pollutants that are dissolved in water. Um, the beauty of sand, rapid sand filters, however, is that they have a really uh, high um, capacity to, to filter water. And they are low maintenance. And this maintenance um, procedure can be automated. Slow fat sand filters, on the other hand, um, are capable of removing pathogens. They can remove many pollutants. They are very low maintenance. The downside, the challenge with slow sand filters is that they are slow with the flowing water. Typically, the treatment rates are about a half to two gallons per minute per square yard um, surface area of the sand bed. Since this is a biological system, there is actually very little mechanical removal, although some does occur. Um, after um, the sand it itself is actually a matrix on which um, a, a community of microorganisms grow, uh, specifically at the surface of the sand bed. After, after a time, the surface uh, becomes slimy, and the, the, the term that's associated with that slime film is uh, schmutzdecke, and that's where most of the biological treatment occurs. Um, the treatment does, uh, capacity does continue down uh, into the sand bed down to about six inches below the surface. There's quite a bit of studies that have been done um, on trying to identify the, um, the organisms that are responsible for the, for the treatment. And they've, they've, researchers have found algae, uh, different types of bacteria, diatoms, and zooplankton that are involved with, uh, in those that are consists of um, or comprise those communities. But the mechanisms of how, they, how they, um, the purification, the treatment works hasn't um, been fully dis disclosed yet or described yet. There's quite a bit of um, research done actually on slow sound filters, but it's been, the research has, done, has focused mainly on developing drinking water. Uh, so they focused on uh, human pathogens. There is a, a, a um, reports that they do remove nutrients, although the, uh, they're not as efficient as uh, constructed wetlands in doing that. And they do remove a large range of chem chemical pollutants. The uh, uh, collaborator we have here on campus is in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and who focuses, whose specialty is on sand filtration systems. And they've identified sand filters as removing um, pollutants, such as MTBEs, uh, additives, and gasoline, for example. So what, uh, how's a, what comprises a slow sand filter? Well, uh, the sand itself is the, is the key. Um, the, the, the sand grains must be uh, of uniform size, rounded uh, sand grains. Um, uh, sharp sand can, it can uh, pack, and that will restrict water flow. A 60 mesh uh, sand is ideal. Um, that's about a 0.3 millimeter diameter um, grain. Uh, we use uh, sand blasting sand because it's very uniform, and uniformity is also a, a key um, in uh, getting good performance in the sand bed and the sand filter. Uh, a one meter uh, water depth over the sand is necessary to create the pressure to flow the water through the sand. Since it's a biological system, uh, the sand must be submerged at all times. Uh, uh, the sand surface should not be disturbed. Uh, critical is flow control. Um, if the flow 
rates are too rapid, then we have found that um, depending on the quality of water that the, uh, the sand, uh, the pores in the sand bed can plug prematurely and that will, would mean that uh, maintenance is required to, to re reattain the proper flow. Uh, slower flow rates are, are, are beneficial in, in um, ensuring that proper treatment occurs. Recommendations are for a, a sand depth of about one meter or one yard, um, and that there at least be two filters installed at an, at an installation. And the reason for these two recommendations is that uh, as the sand plugs, as the Schmutzstuck becomes so thickened that it restricts flows, that the filter will have to be taken out of operation. Um, and then uh, about half inch or one inch of the top surface uh, layer of sand needs to be removed and then the, um, the, sand, the filter can be um, returned to operation. So while that one filter is being uh, maintained, taken out of operation, the other filter can remain operational. So uh, this is a graphic of how a slow sand filter might look. Um, untreated water is introduced into the sand um, con um, bed container. Uh, here's the uh, water that uh, at about a one meter depth. Uh, sand bed is below that um, uh, at, a, at a one meter depth. Below that is an is an underdrain system uh, that uh, consists of let's say a, a pipe manifold uh, with perforated pipe in in pea gravel uh, to collect the the treated water. And that treated water is pumped out of the container, out of the containment uh, uh, unit, and then um, uh, through a flow, uh, either measuring device or metering device to control the flow, um, and then uh, out into a system for that water to be treated. If if the topography is is a, is is uh, appropriate at, at the location where the system might be located, um, this the entire system might be gravity driven. So a, a, a system design might look like this, where um, here's the here's a sand uh, filter. Incoming run, runoff is introduced into the sand bed. Um, there's a float uh, uh, switch or float detection so that it, um, when there's water present, that water could be pumped into two, the two sand filters. Uh, overflow is returned back to the containment where the captured water um, is caught. Uh, the treated water goes through flow control to, to control the rate that the water passes through the sand bed, and the treated water is um, contained into a, a storage containment. Usually, uh, captured runoff uh, um, uh, occurs in surges after irrigation events or maybe storm events, so there needs to be a containment uh, for that uh, captured runoff. The sand uh, the water being treated goes through the sand beds at a constant rate, and so then uh, that water needs to be captured for prior to use. Uh, the, that water to be used as pressurized and returned back to irrigation. If there's no uh, water in the captured tank, uh, that some of this water has to return back to the sand filters so that uh, water can continue passing through the sand to, to maintain that, that biological system. Um, if there's no uh, treated water uh, that could be used, then uh, there needs to be some uh, uh, control to take advantage of some other water source. So there might be a float switch in a, in a, in a storage containment um, to switch um, uh, to the alternate water source. So here's a, here's a typical or a, a system that was being installed in uh, Southern California. And you can see the containment, containment could be anything. It could be a reservoir, or in this case it's a septic tank. Uh, in this case, uh, I, I estimated the surface bed of this uh, septic tank at about 50 square feet, so it could treat about 4,400 gallons per day. This is a system that's uh, in the UK. Uh, it's a larger system, obviously. Uh, this here's the the containment for the sand filter, and it's estimated at about a 33 diameter tank, and that has capacity of treating about 76,000 gallons per day. And then that treated water is contained in this uh, protected storage container. So to look at how these systems work, um, we set up some experiments where we generated a captured runoff in, a, in the greenhouse. Uh, we inoculated 
the, the captured runoff with, with pathogens, by Kepsis in this case. Um, we ran the, that inoculated water through some, some sand, sand filters and collected water samples um, before the sand bed, and we actually collected water from within the sand bed and then after it passed through the uh, treatment system and then it looked for the pathogen in plating. And so here's our greenhouse system. Here's the plants that we used to generate the runoff. We captured the runoff in these tanks. Every day we moved that captured runoff to this tank where we inoculated with Phytophthora kipsisi, and you can see the sand columns here in the back. And here's Mike Harris, the graduate student working on the project, and uh, a graphic of how these sand uh, columns were, were built. And he's adjusting the flow rate um, as he's retrieving water samples. And so what he found was, um, the, the salmon bars are the pretreatment uh, relative counts of, uh, of the pathogens. Um, this is the is day zero when we introduced the water to the, the sand columns. And you can see that there's, we've recovered pathogens throughout the sand uh, fil filter. Uh, after five days, you can see reduction in, in populations. And then after about uh, 15 days, there's nearly complete removal of the pathogen. So the other things that we want to look at are, as Sarah mentioned, is looking at um, uh, coupling with other vegetated systems. Uh, I could, you know, we also want to look at to see what uh, what is in these biofilms and uh, how how these biofilms actually operate. Um, coupling with uh, with other uh, uh, filtration systems might improve um, the efficacy of the um, filtration system. And as today, we can find no one that's looked at removal of uh, plant viruses and nematodes. So that's something that we're going to undertake. So to finish this off, um, biological treatment systems, um, uh, as Sarah has, has mentioned, is that they require little or no inputs. If you compare that to an energy-based system, such as UV radiation or chemical-based system, such as chlorination, there's a constant need for energy or, or uh, chemical inputs. Um, the biological systems can remove nutrients, chemical pollutants, and pathogens. Um, but the challenges with them are that uh, the flow rates are very low. So this might mean that uh, land is needed, would be needed to take in, be taken out of production uh, so that, uh, for example, slow sand filters, because of low flow rates, will have to store large volumes of water or with construct constructed wetlands. Be even though they have higher flow rates, but uh, uh, there needs to be an, an adequate retention time um, in order to, to attain proper treatment. So both, uh, although both vegetated and slow sand filtration systems have these long residence times, and uh, the, one of the uh, challenges with slow sand filters is that they can clog if there's a high level of particulates suspended in the, in the water to be treated. Um, so one of the things that we would like to, to study or to like to examine is how uh, co combining uh, slow sand filters with vegetated uh, systems might improve the efficacy of the treatment. And that's the presentation I have for slow sand filters and combining those slow sand filters with vegetated systems. And uh, please feel free to contact me if you have any other questions that you'd like to, to have answered. Thank you. <laughs>